the Larchmont of the Joy Line, with a route between New York and Rhode Island, was not a ship that was considered lucky. Her life seemed to be a series of incidents, each of which could have abruptly ended her career. Her 26-year-old captain also could be considered to have a streak of bad luck. He had been a pilot on the Joy Line's ship, the Tremont, when she had burned, becoming a total loss. The Larchmont was his first command, though, and their luck was about to get far worse. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the story, The Icy Death of the Larchmont? Here we are. Enjoy! The Larchmont had originally sailed under the name of the Cumberland. The 1,605-ton side paddle wheel steamer had been built in 1885, but early on in her career, she had been struck in Boston Harbor by another ship and sank. She was raised and put to work once more, only to catch fire in 1902 with 200 panic-stricken passengers on board. The fire had been put out by the crew, and they had been able to land the passengers safely, but the Larchmont had been damaged. 1904 was a particularly bad year for the ship. She ran down the schooner D.T. Melanson off Stratford and grounded twice, once in Narragansett Bay and once near Prudence Island. 1904 was also coincidentally the year that the other Joy Line ship, the Tremont, with the future captain of the Larchmont, an officer aboard, burned. In 1905, the Larchmont caught fire again this time off North Brother Island, due to faulty insulation. Once more, her crew had been able to put out the fire, and the Larchmont had enjoyed an unusually quiet year through 1906. She was a new addition to the Joy Line, and placed in command of her was Captain George McVeigh, who had only been made a ship's master 18 months before. The Larchmont left Providence the night of the 11th on February 1907 with a full cargo. Between 75 and 150 passengers in addition to the ship's company, which numbered between 30 or 50 depending on the source. The ship's purser shortly after the accident said that he believed there were 125 passengers and 45 people in the crew. It was a bitterly cold night and she was unknowingly headed into a winter storm. As the Larchmont rounded Point Judith, she was hit with the full force of the icy gale, which began to coat her in ice, though she was able to continue down Block Island Sound without any difficulties, her two paddle wheels still carrying her forward. Captain McVeigh was just beginning to feel as though he could leave the deck. Up until this point, he had been standing in the pilot house, but after taking a walk around his ship to ensure all was well, he was just about to head to his cabin when the Larchmont's whistle suddenly let out a series of bursts, which alarmed him enough that he rushed back to the pilot house. The pilot and the quartermaster pointed to a three-masted schooner coming right at them. The schooner with the advantage of the strong wind at her back, was coming towards them quickly. Sailing vessels got right of way, and were expected to hold their course while the Larchmont was supposed to adjust her course. The officers of the Larchmont would later claim that they had done just that, but that the oncoming schooner, which proved to be the Harry Knowlton, under the command of Captain Frank Haley, suddenly lurched into their course. They blew a couple more blasts on their whistle, and did their best to spin the ship's wheel to avoid the oncoming schooner. Though the Larchmont started to veer, it was far too late. The Harry Knowlton crashed into the port side of the Larchmont, forcing the bow of the schooner almost halfway through the Larchmont. For a moment, the two ships were stuck together, and the Harry Knowlton prevented the Larchmont from flooding. But... Then the storm separated the two ships, 
and the water began to pour into the stricken steamer. The Harry Knowlton was badly damaged, and once they were separated from the Larchmont, they could not spare any thought for anything other than reaching the shore. Captain Haley ordered his ship towards land in the hopes that they would be able to reach the Harry Knowlton, but around 1.30 in the morning, the ship gave a lurch that caused Captain Haley to order the abandoning of the ship. Captain Haley and his small crew of six men were only a mile from the beach when they took to the boat, but it was a miserable pull with strong winds and ocean spray washing over them. The only thing to keep them warm was rowing and the men were soon being covered in ice that cracked every time they extended their arms to pull the oars. Even once they reached the shore of Rhode Island, they were forced to walk a distance to a life-saving station, where they found shelter and warm food. None of them would have any permanent effects from the accident, and they had all arrived safely. It was far from how the Larchmont was faring. The blow had cut off the communication between the engine room and the pilot house, so Captain McVeigh was not immediately aware of the extent of the damage. Realizing he was not getting an answer from the engine room, Captain McVeigh sent the quartermaster down to check on the damage and called the crew to their stations. Noticing that the ship was listing to starboard, Captain McVeigh realized that his ship was sinking even as the quartermaster returned with a request from the chief engineer that Captain McVeigh try to beach the boat as soon as possible. Captain McVeigh returned to the pilot house and sent the needed signals to the engine room, but there was still no means of communication. No one had told him that the engine room was no longer getting his signals. Realizing that he could not direct the ship to begin moving again, Captain McVeigh returned to the deck where the boats were being lowered. The collision happened around 11 o'clock at night, a time when most of the people on board had been asleep. The passengers who had been in their berths were flung from their bunks by the course of the collision, and their confusion was made worse by the fact that the water rushing in was hitting the boiler room, causing billowing steam to begin to fill the ship. Many of the passengers who had just woken up thought that the ship was on fire. Panic-stricken passengers rushed to the deck, most of them not stopping to even clothe themselves properly. It was a choice that they would soon regret. The temperature on deck was bitterly cold, and there was no chance to go back to their cabins to remedy the situation. The ship was sinking fast, and the cabins that they had left were now filled with water. Captain McVeigh would later say that he strongly suspected that a majority of the passengers never made it to the deck and found it likely that they had been trapped below, never knowing what had happened to the ship until it was too late. For the people who did reach the deck, the urgency of the situation was quickly apparent, and some of the sailors had to hold back the passengers who were desperately trying to rush the lifeboats and rafts, while the rest of the crew began to lower them. The initial newspaper articles would paint a dramatically different version of events than what would eventually come out in the later interviews and investigation of the wreck. Initially, it was reported that women were given the safest spots as the men on board considered it their duty, and that the women had been allowed to board the lifeboats while the men had taken the less safe rafts. It was also reported that Captain McVeigh had taken charge of the evacuation and that he had been the last person to leave the ship with his boat cutting loose just before the ship sank. It is not clear whether this was a version that Captain McVeigh initially told, or if it was the romantic impulses of the reporters. What is known is that one of the passengers quickly came forward to give a different version. He said that, instead of allowing the passengers to board the boats first, the crew had quickly piled into them, providing little for the safety of the passengers. Not only that, but the passengers added that Captain McVeigh was one of the first boats, if not the first boat, to leave the sinking Larchmont. The passenger who made the accusation was 18-year-old Frank Hirgesell. 
who was quick to tell his version of events. He had been in bed in his stateroom, but he was still wearing his clothing when the collision had occurred. His room was one of the ones most deeply impacted by the collision, so he had been alerted quickly to what had happened and had rushed to the deck. On deck, he found officers reassuring the passengers, telling them that they were in no immediate danger, while Hirgesel watched the ship's captain step onto the first boat that was launched. Meanwhile, not all of the boats were launched, and one of them was launched without any oars. Some of the crew had now also joined in the rush for the boats, and a group of them swarmed a boat to the extent that it went down and they were all lost. Another passenger, Oliver Genevier, had gone to the saloon to find that everything was filled with steam and passengers panicking. He did what he could to help launch lifeboats and then remembered that he had been sharing his cabin with another passenger he had met on the ship. He went back to try to help him evacuate, but by now the ship was full of steam and it was suffocating. His cabin mate was delirious and panicking and began fighting him to the extent that realizing that if he stayed any longer, he was risking himself. Genevieve abandoned his rescue mission and returned to the deck where he found a boat that still had the canvas cover. Once he managed to lower the boat, he found that people on the deck were fighting one another to join him, with men pushing women aside. More passengers were still running around the deck, shouting for life preservers. Eventually, seven more men joined Genevieve in his boat, and they began to row away from the large boat. Two women, who were already in the water, grabbed the side of the boat, and Genevieve pulled them on board as well. One by one, the men on the boat began to drop due to the bitter cold, until it was just Genevieve and one other man. This man, deciding that he had no chance left, ended his suffering with his own hands, using a razor, leaving Genevieve alone. The waves carried Genevieve past the lighthouse. The storm was still too strong for him to try to steer to land, but then the wind changed and bore the macabre boat to land, where Genevieve jumped out and waded to shore. Around 7.30, Genevieve staggered to a life-saving station uncertain how he alone had survived to tell the tale. When the surfman who cared for Genevieve found the boat that he had taken from the Larchmont, he found that the entire boat was encased in ice so much that they could not tell the contents. All across Block Island, the residents woke up and heard of the disaster that had occurred right off their shore. In spite of the cold and foul weather, the island mobilized, searching for survivors and collecting the dead. Many of the survivors that they did find were suffering so badly from frostbite that it horrified the people who found them. Two of the life-saving stations became temporary morgues. It was beginning to become more and more clear the terrible toll taken by the freezing water. The Block Island schooner, the Elsie, was able to pull a few people out of the sea who had managed to cling to spars and floating pieces of deck, all passengers. This group consisted of three men and two women, including a married couple. They had managed to keep warm the best they could by pounding on one another and flailing to try to keep blood flowing. David Fox said that he had been asleep on the lower deck when the accident had happened, and water had come rushing down on him. Finding that he was waist-deep already, the door stopped being an option, and he pulled himself through a portal onto the promenade deck. Here he found the chaos of the panicking passengers, and he had only escaped the sinking ship by being on a piece of deck that had broken from the wreck. The married couple who the Elsie had pulled from the water, the Feldmans, also told their story. They had gone to bed around ten that night. It was a later bedtime than they usually had, but they had enjoyed a concert put on by some people from the Salvation Army who were on board. Having been woken up by the crash of the collision, the couple got up and both had put on their warmest clothing before going up on deck. Here, Mr. Feldman found a boat still hanging by the davits, having not yet been lowered. He lifted his wife into it, 
but it was too high above him for him to pull himself into, and he told her he would find his own way to escape the ship. Mrs. Feldman had no interest in being separated from her husband, and she leapt from the boat and rejoined him on the deck of the Larchmont, which was now deep underwater. They were among the lucky ones who found themselves on the piece of deck that broke from the sinking ship. All through the night, Mr. Feldman took it upon himself to keep as many people on their makeshift raft awake as possible, moving among them and trying to stop them from falling asleep. Those who survived the night on the piece of decking credited his efforts. Multiple times they saw ships that they tried to hail, but each time the storm was too loud for them to be heard until they were found by the Elsie. The crew of the Elsie suffered badly from the effects of the cold weather, and soon they too were showing signs of frostbite, but they continued their work, trying to save who they could. They were rewarded for their bravery with gold medals from the Carnegie Hero Fund, and their children were provided with money to attend college. It was found once the day was over that only ten of the crew had survived, and nine of the passengers. They found shelter on Block Island until the Joy Line sent one of their other ships, the Kentucky, to help with the recovery efforts happening on Block Island and bring the stranded people of the Larchmont back to Providence. The life-saving crews from Block Island did everything they could, though the work took its emotional toll. The weather that had proved so deadly also made it harder to work. The crews risked hypothermia and frostbite themselves as they went out in the hopes of finding any more survivors and to collect those who had frozen. On several occasions, they were forced back in their boats due to the strong waves and winds. Though ships and boats were also sent to search for the wreck of the Larchmont, this proved difficult at first, and for several days all that could be found was floating debris. The largest funeral was held by the Salvation Army, who had many people on board the Larchmont as passengers. Ten women, who the night before had entertained the passengers with a concert, were said to not have even attempted to escape the sinking ship but had instead knelt on the deck singing hymns until the ship sank. 3,500 people came to the service held by the Salvation Army in their honor. As the toll mounted, attention turned back to the statement made that Captain McVeigh had been among the first to leave the ship. As public pressure mounted, Captain McVeigh felt obliged to offer a justification. He admitted that his boat was probably one of the first away from the sinking ship, but he offered several explanations. Each member of the crew had an assigned boat, and his was boat one, the largest. It was on the starboard side of the Larchmont, and due to the starboard list of the ship, it had been very near the water when he had gotten on board it. There had been no passengers near his boat, so it was his intention to go around the ship in his boat so that he could reach the port side of the ship where most of the passengers had crowded. He credited the swiftness with which he had been able to free his boat from the wreck with the fact that he had some of the best crew members on the ship on board of his boat. In spite of this, the waves and the cold wind had been too much for him to round the ship, and the waves had beaten them back, causing them to drift. He insisted that they still did not leave the ship until it had sank completely, and that he had been on the lookout for anyone who he could help, but he did not see anyone. The officers on board of his boat agreed with this account, and defended his actions, but two firemen from the ship's engine room told a different story at the later inquest. One of the firemen who was assigned boat one said that when he reached the Blythe boat, the captain was already on board and that no one was trying to control the crowd of passengers any longer. He said that Captain McVeigh had given no orders, and only the quartermaster had tried to row the boat. The other firemen had gotten on board the boat when he had seen the quartermaster and the purser clamber into it. He said that he had seen Captain McVeigh try to push their boat away from the sinking ship. There was nothing decided conclusively as to the motives of Captain McVeigh, 
though at least one article did question the captain admitting that he had taken the largest boat with the best crew for himself, and pointed out that over half of the survivors of the wreck had been members of the crew. It did not have much to do with the assignment of blame for the wreck in any case. This fell on the shoulders of first pilot John Anson, who had been in command of the Larchmont at the time of the wreck. Later, rumors would suggest that perhaps there had been some truth in the officers of the Larchmont's accounts that the Harry Knowlton had been steering erratically and had lurched into their course too late for them to respond. It was suggested in the shipping community that the helmsman of the Harry Knowlton had been driven from the wheel by the bitter cold to find some warmth and that there had been no one in control of the Harry Knowlton when the collision occurred. This was never confirmed, and the blame still officially rests with the Larchmont. The Larchmont was eventually found, and there was talk about torpedoing her to release some of those who had gone down with her, as a service to their families. This was eventually rejected, due to concerns of what the wreckage might do to other shipping. The Larchmont, it was decided, as so many shipwrecks before it, became a tomb and a memorial to a terrible night. For more information, please see the New York Times from February 13, 1907, or see our other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.